Room 6, which is a Brexit briefing. Uh, I just want to advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief committee on health-related Brexit issues, and I refer members to papers at tab 6 of the pack. So, can I welcome in person Ms Cathy Harrison, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, who is, I understand, heading up the department's EU exit team, and Ms Emer Smith, who is Head of Medicines Policy and EU exit. And also by video link, um, we are having some technical difficulties, but hopefully we have um, Ms. Patricia Quinn Duffy, EU exit lead on reciprocal healthcare and workforce issues, and Ms. Fiona Taylor, who is EU exit lead on medicines. You're very welcome here today. Thank you very much. It's nice to see people uh, in person, so you're very welcome. Um, and Cathy, I believe you are going to brief us initially with some questions. Uh, um, first of all, good morning everyone and thank you for the opportunity to provide an update to the Health Committee on the current EU exit health related issues. I am the Senior Responsible Officer for um, EU exit within the Department of Health and I am leading an EU exit transition unit. And that, that unit has been established to oversee our department's readiness for um, an, over a number of, of different areas. Okay, and the unit has pulled together a range of expertise from across the department, which has been working on EU exit for a number of years. And now this is just because we are moving into an accelerated period of um, operational readiness in preparation for the transition date um, that the unit has been established under my leadership. So, as SRO, I propose to provide regular updates to the committee um, on EU exit issues um, that are relevant to the Department of Health. And today, as an introduction, I would like to provide a, a broad overview of the EU exit um, considerations that are ha happening at the moment, the key issues. But I would propose that to provide more regular updates, and I'm happy to have those timetabled. Um, for the committee and that would allow us to drill down into specific issues in more detail because you will see as I speak today there's a huge range of issues a lot of detail and they do they are those issues are worthy of you know further consideration should the committee wish to look at those so I'll, uh, I'll begin with a brief um, and broad overview so um, you will all be aware that the UK left the EU on the 31st of January 2020 and moved into a transition period which runs until the 31st of December this year. And during uh, this time frame, the UK will follow EU law and regulatory processes in line with the January 2020 withdrawal agreement, which outlined the negotiated terms of the UK's withdrawal from the EU. At the end of the transition period, the Northern Ireland Protocol to the Withdrawal Agreement will take effect in Northern Ireland. And the Northern Ireland Protocol, as you, as you all know, was introduced with the aim of avoiding a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, whilst ensuring that the UK, including Northern Ireland, will leave the EU as a whole. And the protocol covers a range of areas, including common travel area, customs and trade, and regulation of manufactured goods, amongst others. And um, I'm going to outline um, some of the key issues relating to health, and I thought it might be helpful if I um, outlined as I go through where those issues are have an impact on north-south and where they uh, impact on east-west, and also uh, that's where relevant. So you'll see I'll pepper my present... My, uh, with that and also I will point out where relevant where issues are likely to be day one issues from January and where there's likely to be longer term implications. So um, the first thing I'd like to say is for the last number of years my colleagues and I in the department have been working very closely with the Department of Health and Social Care in England and the other devolved administrations on UK preparedness plans for EU exit and that work has already established a wide range of mitigations which are UK wide and the, our primary focus in that was always against the risk of leaving EU without a, de without a deal. Okay, and, and just to point that is still a, a risk at this moment in time that we could leave the trans um, transition period without a deal. So, for example, in medicines, um, all of that work has established a very complex multi-layered approach for contingencies relating to medicines. 
and which I can provide more detail on at a future time. But that covers, for example, the establishment of buffer stock, so we're holding more stock in the UK, uh, additional warehousing, um, also rerouting and freight arrangements, also uh, enhanced arrangements for trader readiness, shortage management as well, and regulatory um, considerations. These are national plans which include Northern Ireland and have included us in the development of those plans. But in addition to those plans which are UK-wide, there are specific considerations relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol. And uh, these areas cover, also cover quite a broad range of issues, and this including supply of medicines and medical devices, access to healthcare and food standards, which I'm going to focus on today, those areas. The first thing is about medicine supplies and medical supplies more widely. I'm going to focus mostly on medicines today, but when I'm in this area and when I'm giving the updates, it will cover all medical supplies, and that will cover a broad range of medical devices, consumables, blood, tissues, organs, etc. So we can come back to any of those. Today I'm talking really about medicines. But Excuse <coughs> me a second, uh, yeah? Chair, with your indulgence. Would it be possible to direct the microphone uh, oh, can you hear me? more towards you? Um, I'm Okay, is that, is that better? Oh, it is, yeah. Okay, yeah. right. I'll move a little closer to this. Let's see. Okay, so the first thing on medicines is um, uh, that is of interest is that 98% of our medicines that we use in Northern Ireland are transported from Great Britain uh, into Northern Ireland via the Northern Irish ports, and the majority of those are distributed through the UK Wholesaler Network. Okay. And at this moment in time, the whole of the UK is aligned with the EU key for medicines and medical devices. This, this will change after transition, <clears throat> when Northern Ireland will remain aligned with the EU key and GB will not. So this has east-west implications for both the supply and regulation of medicines in Northern Ireland. And there is a dedicated work programme going on at the moment to look at all of the issues related to this and mitigations that may be needed. And that involves my officials and DHSC and other stakeholders. Uh, one issue that the committee may be aware of is um, in relation to the fact that after transition, Northern Ireland will still have to comply with certain EU directives relating to medicines. And one of those is called a falsified medicines directive. And this FMD, um, so, uh, and so it, FMD, we will still, um, supplies of medicines into Northern Ireland will still have to comply with FMD after transition date, but they will not in GB. And FMD affects the majority of our prescription only medicines. And in a nutshell, it, it, was, it was introduced um, as an important measure to um, protect the medicine supply chain from the entry of fraudulent medicines. And, and, and what it does is it has, so manufacturers are required to put in place uh, a safety feature, which is a unique barcode on each pack. And that information on each pack is uploaded onto a central database in your Euro European database. And then on supply of the medicine to a patient, the medicine is decommissioned from effectively the stock that is known about. So there's an end to end understanding of that system. Um, now, our continued compliance with FMD raises a number of issues relating to medicine supplies and regulation, and a 12-month derogation has been requested uh, by the UK government from, to the EU to allow time for the various mitigations to be put in place. Um, but work is very active in that area at the moment, and there's um, so the, another issue related to medicine supplies is. Um, the requirement for goods moving between GB and Northern Ireland to abide by importation requirements. And there may be a number of mitigations that we need to introduce to, in relation to avoid the risk of any delay that may occur in our medicine supplies coming as a result of additional checks or tariffs related to those. And so in that area, that's all I'm going to say about medicines supplies, but uh, you know, there's a lot of work going on here. A lot of work, a lot of legal advice is being sought, a lot of mitigations are actively being worked up in this area, and the committee will be fully appraised of those as they develop. Uh, the next issue I'm going to talk about is access to healthcare, and this is more of a north south issue. And um, from day one, there are a range of areas relevant to access and healthcare after EU exit, including continued access by UK citizens to emergency healthcare in the Republic of Ireland. 
and the Department of Health Social and Social Care in England and the Department of Health in Dublin are working on an enduring reciprocal health care agreement between the UK and Ireland, and this will not impact on any current North-South health services which are based on either a, ne a memorandum of understanding or service level agreement. There's a number of other areas, issues in this, um, in terms of access to healthcare, that are north, south, and have also have east, west implications. One of those is the cross-border healthcare directive, and that enables UK citizens to access healthcare in any EU country and be reimbursed for the, their care abroad by their home country. And day one after the end of transition, this facility will no longer apply to the UK. However, if someone has applied to use the conditions of the directive before the end of transition, reimbursements for treatments will be honoured for up to a year on certain conditions. And in the longer term, the department is still considering the policy around the application of the principles of the cross-border health care directive. Another area is citizens' rights provisions. And citizens' rights provisions in the withdrawal agreement provides a framework for the continued legal residence and rights of EU citizens living in the UK and UK nationals living in the EU at the end of the transition period. And Westminster are con coordinating the application of citizens' rights for access to health care. And for day one, the Department of Health is working with the Department of Health and Social Care in England to establish processes and develop communications for more information on that. And in the longer term, and the implications of that are that people are likely to move in and out of the scope of the provisions, uh, depending on their life decisions. Um, immigration, you may be aware that a new points-based system will be introduced in January 2021, and the Department is engaged with the EU Exit Workforce Working Group, including employers, regulators and unions from across health and social care. And from day one, post-EU exit, any EEA nationals uh, living in Ireland who want to work or study in Northern Ireland will have to apply for a visa, but in the longer term, and in the longer term, the new points-based immigration system uh, may not facilitate people working in lower skilled roles. These are issues that don't just apply to health. Um, a further workforce area that is relevant to UEXIT is the recognition of professional qualifications, which will be covered by my colleague Patricia Quinn Duffy in the next agenda item this morning for the committee. The final issue that I wanted to cover um, in the update is um, relates to food standards. And the Food Standards Agency have been preparing a legislative programme to ensure that for areas in its policy responsibility, both GB and NI legislation is updated to keep pace with EU law during the transition period and to secondly reflect the application of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol in GB and Northern Ireland by the end of the transition period. Uh, that's the end of the, the, the key areas I wanted to talk about. There was a number of areas that are, have arisen uh, recently that I thought I could just also give a, 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 an update on and also issues that I think would be of interest to the committee um, chair. The first one of those is the committee may be interested to know the volume of legislative work that is likely to be associated with this, which will be coming through here. And I have been advised that at the, at the moment our estimate is there will be at least 11 statutory instruments will be coming through uh, the committee in relation to these uh, um, EU transition. Um, so, uh, Just a word on common frameworks as well. Um, common frameworks, um, uh, I understand you ha are, have got uh, an update on that separately, but uh, in terms of health, there are a number of common frameworks which relate to blood safety and quality, organs, tissues set and cells, public health and reciprocal and cross-border health care arrangements. And um, the final issue is the Internal Markets Bill. And the bill was introduced to the House of Commons and given its first reading on Wednesday, the 9th of September 2020. And obviously, this is a relatively new development in, uh, and we have sought legal advice on the implications of that for our work programme. And that's still pending. That's where we are with, with that. So, in summary, uh, Chair, uh, the, since uh, July and when you received the last written update, um, I can advise that there has been an acceleration of activity relating to both national contingencies and also work relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol, and that that work is now continuing, and particularly with relation to Northern Ireland Protocol, at a pace. Um, the new um, Department of Health EU Transition Unit that I'll be leading um, will progress a work programme now in the coming months 
and we will be looking at the areas that I've covered today, and they will include health care supplies and regulation, um, issues relating to access to health care and movement of people, issues relating to data sharing, and also the legislative programme. And I would just repeat that I would uh, propose that um, I would provide regular updates to the committee on this, given the wide scope of work that needs to be done in the coming months. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cathy. And obviously, this is an incredibly complex area of work, and I don't envy your your role, your role in it. Um, there, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the members, and you touched on the internal market bill there, and and that you're waiting for that legal advice coming back. But have you? Can you give any indication, even as to um, the? Uh, the extent that you may believe that the challenges that are faced by the department as a result of the NI protocol, you know, do you, have you any indication, that even at this point, of um, how those concerns may be alleviated by the um, internal market bill? Um, well, I have to say that we have sought, we have raised quite a number of questions for legal, and so I, d I can't say that much today, other than that my officials and I have read it. We, our initial view is that it relates more to west-east issues, and <coughs> rather than east-west. And my primary concern, entering the next few months, is uh, assurances around our medical and healthcare supplies. Uh, no interruption to those. Um, when we when we uh, eventually end transition period, so the, the, that's why I've asked a number of specific questions around around the bill. But on on, on reading it, it looks more west east. When do you expect to get the um, answers to your questions? I haven't got a specific reply, but it's, yes, it's urgent as soon as possible. All right. I haven't got a specific reply, but it is urgent as soon as possible. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, in reference to the uh, cross-border healthcare bill, can you elaborate on that? Is there, um, is there a time scale? Uh, and can you confirm this is not needed um, by the end of transition? OK, I'm going to ask my colleague, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, would, could, did you hear that? Um, hello, sorry, I'm, I'm on, on the phone. I hope you can hear me OK. We can indeed. Thank you. You're very welcome, Patricia. Um, the cross-border health care directive, um, we hope to have um, some information to the, the Minister shortly um, on the provisions around um, whether or not we would continue the principles around the cross-border health care directive. Um, at this point in time, I, I can't really say what the decision will be um, on that. Um, the bill is a whole placeholder in case the decision is taken to continue with some principles because it will require some changes to primary legislation to the 1972 order to apply any principles that we may wish to continue. Um, because there is a transition period um, with the cross-border healthcare directive, anyone that applies before the end of transition will be honoured um, whether they apply, have started treatment or have finished treatment and required to have their repayment made. So there are provisions at least for that um, for the end of transition. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I understand that North South Corporation is not necessarily uh, directly reliant on EU membership, but, but to what to degree is it um, fully protected or is further work required beyond the bills that have been mentioned? Uh, no, the cross border health care directive bill was specifically for um, the principles around the, the EU directive. So, North South Cooperation and all of the healthcare provisions um, around the North West Cancer Centre, the paediatrics in Dublin, there's out of hours services in, um, in the west of the province. There are lots of, um, there, there, I think there's about 30. 30 um, SLAs and MOUs around North-South cooperation and none of those really have any bearing on EU regulations and should not be impacted and there should be no um, necessity for any bill or any legislation around those so we're not expecting any, any impact on those. In terms of the EU reciprocal health care, 
um, and people being able to access healthcare for necessary treatment if they're on holidays or visiting either from the south to the north or the north to the south will be part of the UK-Ireland um, Enduring Reciprocal Healthcare Agreement. Um, and we're hoping that it will be in place by the end of transition um, to accommodate that. Okay. Um, and in relation to food standards, I'm not sure you want to answer this. I understand that the nutrition, food labelling and composition may be subject of UK-wide common frameworks. And to what extent um, is there an overlap or potential conflict with the NI protocol in terms of adherence to EU standards? And um, what, um, what would be the impact of the Internal Market Bill on this? I think, Chair, I'd have to take that away and, have, and come back to you on that, and we'll take a note and come back to you in writing on that. I don't have anyone in my team on the call today to, to answer a, spe that's a specific question on food standards. Happy to come back in detail. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, with a couple of indications so far, uh, I wanted to go firstly to um, the Chair, Colin Gildernew, who's um, uh, attending remotely today. Colin, uh, can you hear us OK? Would you like to come in with your questions? <clears throat> yes, I, I can hear you, Pam. Are you hearing me? Yes, very clear. Thank you, Colm. Okay, well, thank you very much, and apologies um, apologies to Pam for, for short notice in relation to this. I don't appear, my broadband is not supporting the camera on my end, and that's why I don't think you can see me, but I am seeing yourselves and seeing proceedings clearly and hearing them. Um, unfortunately, I've had to come in remotely today as a result of uh, awaiting, uh, being in contact with someone who is awaiting a test. And as a precautionary measure, I, uh, I, I prefer to come in today by, by remote access. And uh, so, Kathy, thank you very much for your presentation there. And uh, that's all, that's all, you know, it's clear there's going to be an awful lot of complexity, an awful lot of issues to be considered here. You had mentioned 11 statutory instruments being required. Can I just clarify that those, will, those 11 are Westminster legislation rather than uh, the Assembly statutory regs? Yes, that's my understanding. Did you hear that, Tom? Yes. Okay, and then later on. Yeah. In, in, in light of that being so, then, would you, Cathy, in terms of your role within, within the health department and in terms of exiting, would you be concerned at the additional uncertainty that has been injected into the process now as a result of the internal markets bill, that, uh, that these statutory instruments will add further complexity? Um, Chair, I, I mean, at this moment in time, we are working through a programme of statutory instruments. We have not, I'm not been advised that there's going to be any disruption to those as a result of the Internal Market Bill. Is that correct, Emer? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But um, yeah. do you want to elaborate a little bit on the your concern? Well, given, given, that, given that we had a protocol and a withdrawal agreement in place that, that seemed to provide some clarity, and that those, those, that those arrangements now seem to have been thrown into a severe doubt by the, by the bringing of the bill into Westminster, um, and impacting on the potential of achieving a deal which would, which would, get, which would ensure a smooth or as smooth as possible a transition, would you, from your perspective, in terms of your responsibilities, would you be concerned that the Internal Markets Bill is introducing further uncertainty and potentially further disruption in the delivery of health post-Brexit? Um, I think I said at the beginning, we, I mean, in the, within the context of my responsibilities within the Department of Health, I have sought specific <coughs> legal advice to um, inform how it may affect the programme of work that we're working on um, calm. Now that, so I think that advice, I, I would be in a better position to understand if if there is likely to be any disruption at all in terms of the the internal market spill. At this moment in time, I couldn't really say um, that there, you know, that there has been a, an additional risk identified in in relation to the legislative programme. Okay, Kathy, and um, if I may, Chair, just, just a, a slight further one on that point. Um, can, can you also confirm that 
the use of the, the use of statutory instruments is a choice by the minister in terms of of you know that he has he, he has the the authority to make a choice as to whether to use a statutory instrument or use the devolved powers which we already have here so can you confirm whether that's the case and also what areas the 11 statutory instruments are covering okay Imer, do we have the areas yes Um, tobacco, tobacco products and nicotine inhaling products, the Electronic Commerce Directive, the European Qualifications, um, Reciprocal and Cross-Border Healthcare, Human Tissue, Quality and Safety, Quality and Safety of Organs, Blood Safety and Quality, Reciprocal Healthcare, a further one and a f another further one, Reciprocal Healthcare, um, Mutual Recognition, Professional Qualifications and Human Medicines Amendment. There's several there relating to Reciprocal Healthcare. Column. Okay, and, and on, in relation to in relation to the element of that those are specific areas that the minister has chosen to deal with via statutory instrument, um, can you get, can you explain why that you know why the minister why, what's the rationale for using a statutory instrument rather than primary legislation in the assembly? Column. I, I think again, I think I might come back to you on that because that's quite that's quite uh, you know. That's quite a question. I mean, in terms of the um, the programme of legislation that is coming through here, statutory instrument is the is the chosen uh, method by which we will be introducing these changes into Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of the thinking behind that, I will come back to you on your specific question, Colm, uh, in terms of why that has been chosen. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just finally, Chair, sure, and thank you for, for allowing me this. Um, but in in relation to the ongoing day to day arrangements along the whole border corridor where people from north and south may be accessing health care. I see you have mentioned in your brief that that is being worked on or, or is being... So what guarantees have we that that will continue, that very important health care will continue both directions uninterrupted throughout the transition period and after the transition period? Um, can I, I'm going to invite Patricia to come back in here because she's the expert on this particular area. Sure. Chair, there are a number of, of different ways that um, people can access healthcare across the border. We do have the um, North-South Cooperative arrangements, which we do not expect to be interrupted because they are more contractual arrangements um, than based on EU legislation. So there should not be any interruption, and we're not expecting any interruption to those. In terms of reciprocal healthcare arrangements where people can access um, treatments that are necessary if they have an accident or incident while in the other jurisdiction. Um, the UK and Ireland are progressing a um, negotiation to put in place a, an enduring reciprocal health care agreement. Um, discussions on that are at a very advanced stage and we do expect um, that to be in place by the end of the year. Um, but we are looking at contingencies in the off chance that it isn't available. Um, but at the moment, um, the signs are looking very positive. OK. And, and finally then from me, um, in relation to the ongoing continuity of supply of medicines, once again, in light of the internal markets bill and the disruption that that may cause, Cathy, are you satisfied or what guarantees or assurances can you give the committee in relation to the ongoing supply of medicines um, and particularly in relation to the bill, Chair, we have, uh, 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 I'll just repeat that we have sought particular legal advice in terms of the implications of it. And our initial analysis of it is that it, um, will, it, has mainly, um, it mainly concerns the flow of goods from Northern Ireland to GB, which is not relevant to um, our medicine supply chain. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, just this point, could I, could I just ask um, if uh, you could forward that list plus um, the oral briefing in, in writing to us? Um, that's that was Emer's list, plus, plus your speaking note, Cathy, if that's okay? Yes, happy to do that. Yes, well, thank you. Colin, you did the kid it. 
Okay, um, yes, thank you very much indeed. And um, just before, I need to go before 12 o'clock, so I may leave before the end of the presentation. Um, maybe just to begin with, how, how many people are working, just even as an estimate, within the department in preparations for Brexit? Top, sorry, I'm counting up in my head. Uh, seven. seven? Seven people. In the whole department? Or is that just At the moment, though, well, how we are working it is that the expertise that resides across the department will be drawn upon because they, you can see the scope of the work here that we will be looking at. So we will be pulling and working with our whole department in terms of policy areas. But now, um, for this accelerated period, a, um, a unit has been pulled together of... I'm going to count again. Do you forgive, forgive me? You're putting me on the spot here because I should have had it in front of me. Uh, yeah, I think that's... Seven or, seven or eight, I'm sorry, I'd have we'll to take it as a that, 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 It's in that region. It's in that region. That's a dedicated team now that have all come together for this, the, for this um, end stage planning and that, that I'm SRO for. And that's not just pharmaceutical side, that's right no, across that's the across, whole, that's whole across department? that's across the other areas. Okay. Doesn't seem like very many, but um, okay, it's there. Um, maybe just looking at the, 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 the workforce considerations that you had mentioned. Has there been much of a scoping exercise done within the workforce in terms of finding out how many people might have to leave, how many people can stay, how many people will have to apply? Is there help and assistance for people within the workforce to be able to stay? What might happen if there are um, sort of flashpoints where somebody hasn't applied for something? Do they get a period of time to stay before uh, they can, so that they can fill in the information? And um, in terms of potential vacancy management, where there's already a series of vacancies, but will, will this contribute to further, or do you feel that that's all going to be uh, completely covered? And um, just in terms of staff, maybe that cross, cross the border and work on either side of the border, are they under the same rules as everybody else within the EU, or is there a special north-south element to the rules for them? Thank you. Tricia? Area as well. Thank yes, I'm just, I'm just writing out the notes. There's probably three questions there. Um, first of all, for the, the workforce in general, um, unfortunately, um, EU nationality isn't part of the collection of data um, at the point of, of hiring. So it, we actually don't know the number of EU citizens that work within health and social care um, within the trust. Um, so it is a bit difficult to estimate and quantify. However, the Department for the Economy has been doing some work on how many people were leaving, and it seems to have settled down since the, um, the referendum in 2016. Now, all of the European citizens who are currently in Northern Ireland before and working and living here before the end of transition are able to apply for the EU Settlement Scheme. Um, we have been working with the EU Workforce um, Working Group, which um, includes, as, a, with, as Cathy has pointed out, the trusts, the employers in the independent sector, unions and regulators. And we have been promoting and putting out information to staff within those areas on how to apply for the EU Settlement Scheme and what help is available within Northern Ireland to apply. Um, the EU Settlement Scheme is opened until June next year, so there is a six-month um, buffer for the Settlement Scheme, so we will be starting to increase the communications to staff to ensure that people do apply for the Settlement Scheme and regulate, regularise their um, settlement status within uh, the UK. Um, you asked about the, the workforce programme. Um, there is a, a programme of work right across the workforce. As you've said, there are, um, uh, there are other uh, impacts on the, um, the workforce in, in terms of, of COVID and international movement. Um, there is a, a programme of work on, on workforce um, and um, in particular international recruitment, um, which we can 
probably give you some more information on um, in writing, as I don't have the full details because it's slightly outside my, my remit. Um, with the new immigration system from January, all EU citizens who come to work or study in the UK will be required to have a, a proper visa to remain in the UK. This will include EU citizens that live in the Republic who wish to work in Northern Ireland. Irish and British citizens that live in the Irish Republic that want to work in Northern Ireland do not have to apply for those. Um, that would mean that they would need to have a work visa. However, the British government have introduced an NHS visa which fast tracks and is a slightly cheaper option um, than a normal visa for other work areas. They have also uh, started to introduce a, a waiver for the immigration health surcharge for those working in health and social care, which will be available for, um, for the future. Is, is, that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Are, are there any plans to try and um, workforce manage? Because I think it would be, I suppose, maybe accept, commonly accepted. I'm not. I'm not so sure. Just on the basis of the the figures in terms of the factual element, but it would be commonly accepted that there's quite a sizable amount of the health workforce are from outside of Northern Ireland, uh, outside of the UK. So, I mean, is that a is that a, a sort of movable face that you know x amount of hundreds join one year, leave the next year, then another few hundred come in, another few hundred leave, uh, and therefore is the introduction of visas and points based systems likely to cause any um, slowing in, in that train of, of staff that come to here? And, and are there because you know there could be a worst case scenario where there's hundreds and hundreds of staff that go home. Uh, and hundreds and hundreds of staff that don't come to here to make this their home, and that they were then left with the deficit of staffing, and, and how that would be managed. But if we we don't have information on that, that could be something that just arises in, in May, June, July, August of next year, uh, and there could be a shortage of staff, and that could be right across the UK. So we don't have other people to draw in from across the UK to fill that gap. Is there any? Preparedness been carried out for readiness for any scenarios like that? Um, I probably should come back to get a, a written response back to you if it's okay on that. The international recruitment um, is not my area, um, so we can come back to you on um, because the EU citizens from next year will be classified as international recruitment. Okay. Maybe just a second question then. If the worst case scenario kicks in and um, there's no deal and um, we require to go to the, the stock that we have. In general basis, how much stock is, is available for critical mass um, medicines and how long would it take to, to sort of replenish those or set up new procedures? I know you, you used um, I think the, the term of um, shortage management. Just what sort of what's involved in in preparations for shortage management? And uh, I know Boris's normal answers is we'll get a plane load of things for that, but I think we've run out of planes. So um, is is there very concrete preparations being made within the department? And how long? Uh, how much stock is there? The the. the there has been, a, I referred to a multi-layered approach, okay, and, that, and that's exactly what is in place. Um, an enormous amount of work has been done in under, to understand our medical supplies chain in the last number of years since we started our work on EU exit. We've been working hand in hand with DHSC on this, and you know they have uh, put considerable resources into um, uh, enhanced surveillance of the medical supply chains. And that has informed this multi-layered approach. And that, um, so what they did in terms of to a risk analysis was they looked at the, the likely areas where we could have a problem in terms of supply interruption. And a lot of our stock that flows into the UK comes through the short streets, um, you know, from uh, Dover, Calais, uh, those sorts of ports on the south coast. And analysis was done there around, you know, early on and continually revisited around pinch points. So that has resulted in a number of different things happening. So we do have a lot more stock in uh, in the UK at this moment in time than we would have had normally. 
and uh, we had, you know, at, at a point in time, we've had at least six weeks supply of some products, but more of others. Uh, so it depend, it varies depending on what we're looking at, vaccines, insulins, things like that. So we have different arrangements, but we have buffer stocks in place we, to support those enhanced warehousing arrangements. Um, we also have arrangements in place that have rerouted um, uh, to reroute our supplies of medicines away from those short streets should there be a pinch point and into other part other less busy ports in GB and for that stock to be able to travel uninhibited and across GB and into the wholesale chain. Uh, you asked specifically about shortages and there is a dedicated team who work on that now um, uh, in the Department of Health and Social Care, and they link to dedicated teams across each of the devolved administrations. And I have a team here in Northern Ireland that's led by Fiona Taylor, who's on the call, and that reaches out. So that allows any are very. So we have very early intelligence of shortage issues now, and much better than we ever had would have had before. And that allows us to think really um, far ahead of what mitigations may be needed allows us to consider a change in prescribing guidance, for example, or advising prescribers to move from one product to another early on to prevent a shortage arising at the point where you and I would find we would, the medicine wouldn't be available for us. So a huge amount of work there, a very good established arrangements, and also a very good arrangements in Northern Ireland that cover both primary care and all of our trusts. So that. Does that so so that? We, we, today we can give an assurance that nobody will be without their medications come January, February time? Uh, I can give an assurance that, there is a, that the work that is being done here is comprehensive in terms of medical supplies and that um, there is no need for anyone to do anything different you know, in terms of ordering their medicines or, um, or, or, uh, or ordering their prescriptions or anything at this moment in time. That was a really good political answer, but the, well, there definitely nobody needs to worry about getting access to their medicine and from from January onwards. That will be nobody needs to worry about that. that the supply chain will be there for them. Well, the supply chain has over seven thousand lines in it, and all I can give you is an assurance that every single one of those lines is being considered within the within the plans, and there is a huge amount of contingency arrangements in place right now, for to maintain those supplies. Thank you. Um, Alex? No, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, at the moment, you're, you're, you're working on two plans, one for no deal and one if there is a deal. Yeah. OK. Um, if, if we go on to the deal, which is obviously the Northern Ireland Protocols, um, you were mentioning about 98% of our medicines come from the rest of the UK. Um, under that new deal, um, there will be checks and tariffs at our ports. Isn't that correct? Isn't that correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a risk. There's a risk that there could be. Yes. Yeah. So, if if that's the case, is the potential that medicines from the rest of the UK could be delayed because of these new checks and, and, and tariffs? Well, it's one of the areas that we've identified in our work programme, and that's one of the areas we're actually working on right now. Um, so when I talk about mitigations, you know, we're looking at a range of things, and we're looking at even legal interpretations and things like that. So there's, um, you know, as, as written without mitigation, there would be a risk. There's but a it's important that we focus on those mitigations. Um, so without mitigation, there would be a risk. Potential our medicines could be delayed if it's... I think potential. that potential, there is a risk of it, but the mitigations that are being worked up are, will, will ensure arrangements are in place to avoid that, is what, where we are working towards. Well, you hope, but you can't be 100% sure. Well, that's what we're working towards. But you're not 100% yes. sure. Okay. Um, also, you, you mentioned um, about, because um, we're staying within the EU rules on new medicines that... Um, if there's new medicines the rest of the UK can bring in, but in Northern Ireland we have to follow the EU rules. So in theory, a, a new super drug could be brought into the United Kingdom for a, a serious medical condition, but the EU may not have approved it. So that means, would, that, would I be correct in interpreting that, that we in Northern Ireland may lose out on that new drug? 
that's coming to, into the rest of the UK, but because of that, it hasn't been approved through the EU, because we're following their rules, we may be denied that possible new drug. Would that be correct? Well, uh, but um, the, the fact, you're correct in the facts in that we are going to be following EU UK after transition and GB will not and that that has raised a number of issues for medicines licensing. Now, our regulator for medicines licensing is the MHRA, Medicines Healthcare and Regulatory Authority, and they um, have been working on a whole range of, uh, of areas, and they actually issued on the 1st of September a, lo a wide raft of guidance for the pharmaceutical industry, and that's just the first tranche of guidance that's going out, and that the purpose of that guidance is for smooth transition. Now, the issue on day one, um, all the medicines that are used within the UK in all four countries are, are, are EU regulated because they've all been licensed through the EU arrangements. Okay. And, uh, and so, so in the short term, the, the risk that you're describing will not arise. And there is a risk in, in the longer term, again, without putting any arrangements in place to avoid it, there would be a risk that we would have a divergence in Northern Ireland. But that's something that is absolutely, you know, that's a fundamental issue that we're working on with the regulator to make sure that we maintain um, our equity, uh, equitable access to new medicines in line with other citizens in the UK. But so that's it. They, they, are, they, 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 I suppose, I think what you're getting a flavour of is this is there's there are a lot of implications for us leaving at the end of the transition period and there's not a single answer you know or a single assurance that can be given every single one of these issues um, we will need to think think through carefully and and you know advise you on as well in more detail in terms of our principles which are that we shouldn't have our citizens here in northern ireland should have access on an equitable basis to the rest of the uk for our medicines no guarantee yeah. at the moment. Well, the, well, the, well th that's work, that, that is our intention. That is the intention of the work programme. Yeah, well, that and there's no, risk, there's no risk in terms of the short term yeah, because all of our medicines are EU regulated at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Cathy. Um, I know you've been asked I think, twice already, but I'll, I'll try again. Uh, internal Markets Bill, I know you've, you've got a research paper, legal advice coming back. Um, can you give a broad sense of the themes that are being looked at? I mean, obviously, medicine supplies, I presume, uh, but is there any uh, detail look at state aid rules? Because um, obviously, the yeah, Internal Markets Bill proposes to change the state aid rules, and, and my understanding is they allow the British state to intervene in the economy uh, more so. Um, I understand it's mostly about uh, Boris Johnson and the Tories trying to give a hand to sort of technological uh, companies, but I would imagine it wouldn't preclude uh, intervention and uh, financial assistance to uh, pharmaceutical companies um, and medi medical companies as well. So has there been any uh, research into that or thought in that or discussion into that? I think that would be um, helpful. Um, if we can get a comment on that, uh, and then just on the enduring reciprocal healthcare agreement, um, can we get a, a bit of expansion on that? Is that the agreement around uh, getting access to um, surgery, getting access to hospitals, and if you can give us a, a broad sense of what's in that and, and what's not in that, that would be useful. Thanks. I'll take the first two items and then I'll ask Patricia. Um, okay, so. In the Internal Markets Bill, I'm focusing specifically on the areas that are within our work programme in health. Okay, so there's a lot more in it, and a lot. Um, so we have asked, we have submitted a number of legal questions, and they are primarily related to the flow of medicines and medical devices, because that is my, you know, that's that that they're my, that's my primary concern, and I just want to understand to what extent the Internal Markets Bill has any influence on, particularly the East to West movement. But we have asked for clarity on both in both directions. Um, the state aid issue isn't really a Department of Health issue. Um, it, I have I am interested in it, obviously yeah. because of our working with the pharmaceutical industry. But I think it's more um, probably a question for the Department for Economy to advise on that aspect of it. Um, and uh, I, and it isn't something that I have sought advice on, and I don't intend to particularly in in terms of. You know the work program that I'm working on. Can I just respond quickly, Chair? Just, um, I mean, I, I think your point that is the economy generally, but we don't accept that it would have a, a bit of a 
knock-on effect on, on medicine and, and, and health in terms of especially pharmaceuticals could get a, a handout or a sort of a financial encouragement, if you want to put it that way, um, probably would have a bit of an effect. And um, I think that that would be I, I, I'll go back. I do think it's a more of an economy issue because it's more about uh, decisions that maybe the pharmaceutical industry would make around setting up business here and maintaining their business here, as opposed to my remit, which is much more around the medicine supply system. And that is not, it isn't really reliant on whether or not we have a pharmaceutical industry in Northern Ireland or they're accepting state aid. So it, it isn't actually within our, my remit, but um, I, would, I, would advise, I would advise that it's more economy to uh, provide information on that, maybe. And was Patricia coming in on that? Yeah, the enduring recipient health care agreements, please. The, the enduring... The in June, reciprocal health care agreement that the UK and Ireland are negotiating are is basically on the principles that are in the Social Security EU regulations around um, needs arising health care, which would be used with an EHIC card um, around an S2, which is for planned care within the public sector uh, in another member state, and also for um, S1, which would include um, pensioners living in the other state having their health care paid for and um, frontier workers. So those are the, the areas that the Enduring uh, Agreement is looking at. Okay. okay thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I, I noticed the way, Cathy, you, you skirted around the elephant in the room during your presentation when you said that the uh, Internal Markets Bill had recently been introduced and you were seeking legal advice to see how it affected the work you were doing. And I hear what you're saying about their, in, in, in terms of the supply of medicines, that there are 700 lines and you're working on every single one of them. But you, Cathy, as Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, can you guarantee here after the 31st of December that there aren't going to be shortages of medicines? Uh, I mean, I'm go I'm, what I'm going to say is that I don't think there's ever been the level of surveillance in our medicine supply chain as there is at the moment. At this moment in time, even without any, any issues, we would ha always have a certain amount of medicine shortages. So I couldn't give a guarantee that there would be never be any shortages of medicines because at any time there always are shortages of medicines which arise for a multiple of reasons because our pharmaceutical um, industries are global, so anything that arises in any country around the world relating and to I, medicines. I understand that. So, but, so but we would we would have that. If you're asking if there, um, so I can't give a guarantee that there will be no medicine shortages, but I can give a guarantee that there is has never been more emphasis put on the maintaining the medicine supply chains, the level of rigour and understanding that we have around um, where our medicines come from, how we will, they will be maintained, and also that I am working with um, uh, the, all the right people, if you want to hear say that, to make sure that the Northern Ireland issues that I'm primarily concerned about and the flow of our medicines into Northern Ireland are maintained um, without any interruption that wouldn't be seen across the rest of the UK. So. Again, as Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, you are saying effectively that the internal market spill is not going to affect the supply of medicine. Uh, no, I think I've said before we've we've addressed we've sought legal advice on that. So you and don't know? The, well, the, well, I mean, it's a pretty recent development. We've we've sought quite detailed legal advice on it, and I will be in a better position to understand the impact on medicines. Our initial reading of it is it 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 is primarily concerned more with west to east flow and is not going to address uh, or it's not going to impact on the work that we are doing in terms of maintaining uh, supplies from um, GB to Northern Ireland which are my, which is my priority yeah but the, the fact that you're seeking legal advice must mean that you don't know what impact the uh, IM bill is going to have well the bill is quite a complex bill and it's quite quite detailed so I think we're doing the right thing we're seeking the legal advice in a, in our particular areas which are detailed and they're under our my responsibility so I think we've done the right thing we've done we've sought the advice and we're just waiting for it now uh, and so there, there, there is the potential that supply lines could be under in relation to the bill I don't know you don't know 
Well, until we get the legal ad the, the legal advice, okay. and okay. we can then th then what we will do with that advice is we will return to our um, our assumptions in terms of the work that we are doing with medicines. And this is move this is constantly moving. And I do have to say to the committee, the position we're in now is we are moving towards change. Things are changing. This isn't. I, I can't tell you everything will be um, the same as it was before. We're changing. The Northern Ireland Protocol puts us in a position where Northern Ireland is different to GB, and we are working through a range of mitigations to ensure that our medicine supplies are, will not be affected. But uh, you know, and things like the bill and any other changes that arise in the coming weeks, we'll work through to understand how it affects our assumptions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Paula. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you. Some of my questions have already been asked, but it is my understanding that um, there is going to be a North South Ministerial Council meeting coming up shortly, and it is going to be relating to health. Um, well, it's good, health is certainly going to be on the agenda, but to what degree, then, is, are some of the finer details around the cross-border health care directive um, going to be hammered out in that, and, and a wee bit more political agreement around that? And then the second part of that really, then, is you know, I, I would say that the South would get quite a, a, a poor deal in, in such a, a, an arrangement going forward. When you think of how many people we've got on our waiting lists here at the minute, it would be very difficult to see how we would have any capacity then for, for people from the South coming north. So I'm just wondering, to what degree then are you then reading across into the management board of the Department of Health, which is overseeing then the transformation and reconfiguration going forward? Um, I'll come in and, and answer your questions around the cross-border healthcare directive. Um, the, the, there is a, a paper going to the um, North South Ministerial Council um, that is being prepared at the moment. Um, the cross-border healthcare directive is uh, will not apply as it does at the moment to um, the UK, and Ireland in itself has to make the decision as to whether they continue to use the cross-border health care directive um, as Northern Ireland, uh, uh, we're looking at it in the department as well. Um, in terms of the, the amount of, of capacity for waiting lists, most people that use the cross-border health care directive use the private health care sector. Um, the vast majority of people that come north and those that use the health care directive um, going south and to other parts of the European Union, because Ireland is not the only recipient of, of patients from Northern Ireland. They go to the private sector, not to the public sector. Um, so it really does depend on what the capacity is there in terms of people using it um, from the Republic in the North. OK. Um, uh, just as a follow-up then, so then the paper is being prepared at the minute for this next meeting. You know, what, what, what you see the time scales in terms of the negotiation around that and you know, you know, the transparency around that sort of decision making. You know, when, when would we, in the general public or health committee, be aware of, of when that um, will be concluded? Um, I'll be, the, the paper on the cross border health care directive will be going to the minister shortly um, to look internally at, at what the decision making is there. Um, in terms of the reciprocal health care agreement with the UK, um, that is a UK Ireland negotiation and um, the, the communications from it will be coming out of, of those negotiations towards the end of the year, um, which will make it clear what the protocols are between the UK and Ireland. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Orlea? Yes, um, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Cathy, for um, coming along and for your answers so far. Um, I should start off by saying, I think even coming from today's discussion, um, all the members would most certainly welcome as regular updates as we can get, um, because there is so much detail um, contained within the work that you are doing and so much detail that we need to um, wrap our own heads around. So um, I would welcome that, um, future updates. Um, I'm just wondering, I know it's, it's been covered enough um, thus far, but on the legal advice that um, you have um, sought um, in relation to the Internal Market Bill, do you have an indication of when you'll be receiving that legal advice? Because I'm assuming it's even, um, you know, it's, that's obviously going to have an, an impact on um, your own unit's forward planning when you're obviously waiting to see 
um, what, what the advice is, is going to say. So have you any idea, Cathy, when you expect to receive it? No? I'll be on the phone straight away after this yeah. meeting to find out where they are. I'll just, no, we'll, we'll just chase it up now today. But we've, um, um, you know, we've, we've given them an, a, a number of questions to consider and you know, we're expecting it imminently, is all yeah. I can say. Okay. And, and they understand it's urgent. Thank you. And um, I know you had mentioned yourself that obviously things um, are changing and um, you know, we are going to be in a different scenario um, in relation to the divergence between um, the North and Britain. And you had mentioned earlier that obviously the, the, the team that you're working with in the new transition unit, that you are working closely on plans with um, colleagues in England and the other devolved administrations. And I'm just wondering, are any of those conversations happening between your, the transition unit in the Department of Health here and with the South? Um, I, I do have a I do have a contact in the south that I stay close to on in relation to health issues, and um, the, but I have to say that the primary focus of our work at the moment is working um, with DHSC and the devolved administrations. Okay. Um, um, and just one final question, Pam. Sorry. Um, yes. Um, earlier in your presentation, you had referred to. Um, the citizens' rights provisions and that you are working on day one plans. And um, I know you were saying that you are looking at it in sort of, you know, um, you are looking at it in uh, the breakdown of what your, your day one issues are going to be and then the more longer term um, concerns and issues. And I was wondering, could you provide the committee just with that breakdown? So we know that citizens' rights is obviously being considered around day one issues and concerns. Could you provide us with a wee breakdown of what the day one concerns are and then what the longer term concerns are that the unit um, are looking at? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I can do that in writing. Thank you. I should have said that the relationship with the Republic, I'm speaking from the medicines point of view. Yes. Okay, and, and I know that Patricia had already referred to a number of engagements that have been going on for quite a long time in relation to the Republic of Ireland, so yeah. that's me speaking as the pharmacist. With, I'm thinking about the engagement I'm involved with. Okay, Alan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just uh, in relation to uh, Patricia, um, she has reassured us about the, the, the various things that Cathy's just referred to there, the, the cooperation, uh, cross border cooperation between hospitals and, and, and uh, other medical uh, facilities. Um, but in terms of, my understanding is that in the past, uh, the NHS has purchased, say, a, a number of surgical procedures. Uh, from uh, clinics uh, in the Republic of Ireland, and NHS patients have went down to the Republic and had the procedures carried out. Um, will that be still be the case, or are there any obstacles to that continue? I don't think there should be, but just to, to get a little bit of reassurance, maybe from Patricia, that that facility would still be available. Because those, those um, waiting list initiatives and purchasing um, sort of block treatments for surgeries, um, those treatments in themselves will be um, almost like commercial contractual arrangements, and there should be no um, EU issues that that block those um, or exit issues that would would hinder those arrangements continuing or to to be on an ad hoc basis going forward. In terms of patients using um, treatments which would be under the EU regulations currently, because we do have a number of patients that would go to the Republic to have treatments under what's known as an S2 arrangement, um, the procedures under those are uh, part of the negotiations for the um, enduring reciprocal health care arrangement. And we are hoping that those will be able to continue as they are, so those very particular types of treatments would continue under that type of arrangement, which is coordinated through NHS Business Services Authority in, in London. So we do believe that there should not be an impact on um, patients in those circumstances. And uh, Chair, just uh, uh, if I could just place on record uh, to acknowledge and appreciate 
the work that Cathy and her team are, are, are carrying out on our behalf. Uh, it can't be easy to uh, be trying to establish a game plan when the rules are constantly changing, but thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Alan. Um, could I just ask if, um, if there's no further agreement with the EU on recognition of professional qualifications, will that pose a risk uh, to recruitment for, for us? And, and uh, are there any implications for um, staff coming from the Republic of Ireland working in Northern Ireland? Um, I don't know whether you want me to, to, to discuss this now or wait till the next um, agenda item, but um, there are a number of, of provisions in place currently to facilitate if there is no arrangement in the future negotiations with the EU. Um, so there will be a transitional provision uh, arranged with, within the UK for recognition of professional qualifications for EU citizens, for EFTA citizens from uh, Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein and also Swiss citizens who have qualifications from their home territories. Um, there will, uh, if there is no agreement with the EU come to end of transition in this free trade agreement, um, there will potentially be divergence within the UK. Um, the UK and Ireland have signed uh, an MOU um, an overarching one um, which was agreed last year which does highlight um, around the um, continued recognition and working together to recognise professional qualifications within the common travel area. Um, where that ends up at this point in time uh, I don't have details because it's all part of uh, still continuing negotiations. Okay, thank you Patricia and, and I suppose that at this point, um, uh, you, you'll be staying on for the next item anyway, as you just mentioned. Uh, so thank you. Um, can I thank um, Cathy, Emer, um, uh, Patricia, obviously staying on, and Fiona for your attendance here today, and um, wish you well going forward with the, with the very heavy workload. Um, we look forward to seeing you on your next visit to the committee. So thank you for your time today. Okay, members, uh, we'll just keep on moving here. We're on to item 7, which is the UKSI, the European Qualifications, Health and Social Care Professionals, EFTA, States and Miscellaneous Amendments, EU Exit Regulations 2020, and I refer members to tab 7 of the pack. Members, the next two items are UK statutory instruments in respect of which the Minister has indicated his wish for Northern Ireland to be included. The purpose of this statutory in instrument is to amend the existing EU exit legislation for healthcare professionals to implement the recognition of professional qualification provisions in the UK Swiss Citizens' Right Agreement and the EEA EFTA separation agreement agreed by the UK in December in 2018. And members, I can advise you that uh, the department official, Patricia, is, is with us to brief committee on the regulations so you're very welcome again Patricia and if you want to uh, give us your brief thank you thank you thank you very much um, just to give you a bit of background because I don't think you have a, an awful lot of background in, in to where this uh, SI comes from and, and why we're here um, the recognition of professional qualifications EU directive um, was put in place to support the free movement of professionals throughout the European Union um, by making a process for recognising professional qualifications. It was introduced in 2005 uh, and ensured that any professionals that obtained qualifications in one member state was able to have that qualification recognised um, where necessary to practise uh, in that profession or to hold a professional title. Um, there are two routes that professionals can take. One of them is an automatic recognition where professional qualifications have a minimum training standard um, which have been agreed through uh, member states and are listed in the directive. And for healthcare, those would be doctors, dentists, nurses and midwives and pharmacists. Um, other professionals would go through a general recognition um, where the competent authority who on the whole is the regulators within the UK, um, will look at uh, each professional qualification on a case-by-case -case basis, 
basis and assess the professional qualifications. This would be in relation to other um, healthcare professions uh, such as paramedics and social care or social workers. Um, in the UK, um, most regulators are UK wide. The Pharmaceutical Society of Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Social Care Council are the only two Northern Ireland based healthcare professional regulators. The department has been working very closely with the Department of Health and Social Care in England, who take the lead for healthcare professionals. They work alongside the Department for Business, Energy and Industry Strategy and the Department of, for the Economy, who are the lead department in Northern Ireland, as the regulations for recognition of professional qualifications apply to all professions, uh, not just healthcare. We're in this position because following the end of transition period on the 31st of December, the EU directive on the recognition of professional qualifications will no longer apply to the UK. The UK will have an opportunity to amend or replace its system of qualification recognition as it applies to EU member states. The future arrangements are part of the UK negotiation mandate uh, and they are looking to find an agreement to provide a pathway for the mutual recognition of professional qualifications with the EU. Um, however, uh, in preparation for a no deal scenario in 2019, two pieces of legislation were laid in Westminster to close down the application of the directive and to provide mechanisms to make temporary arrangements for the recognition of qualifications. Those two um, break sets of regulations were the European Qualifications Health and Social Care Professionals Amendment Exec to EU Exit Regulations 2019 and the European Qualifications Pharmacist Amendments Etc. EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. In the case where no bila satisfactory bilateral arrangements relating to professional qualifications are agreed with the EU this year, on the 1st of January 2021, the UK Government intends to put in place a temporary system of recognition that allows holders of qualifications to seek recognition of their qualifications in the UK. This piece of le legislation is in particular to implement the recognition of prof professional qualification provisions in relation to the UK-Swiss Citizens' Rights Agreement and the EEA EFTA Separation Agreement, which were agreed with the UK in 2018. Uh, these agreements are separate to the re agreement reached between the EU and the UK in the EU Withdrawal Agreement, and this legislation uh, legislates to embed the agreed rights of citizens of Switzerland, Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein to have their professional qualifications recognised in the UK. Uh, just to note that uh, in particular Switzerland um, has slightly different specific arrangements within their agreement which add for longer term uh, continuous recognition of qualifications and also for the temporary and occasional recognition of Swiss trained professionals. Regulation is fully devolved matter uh, to Northern Ireland, however it has been established practice to legislate on a UK wide basis as the regulators are predominantly established in the UK. Um, to legislate in the Assembly for regulation of all healthcare professionals would involve considerable resource, while there's potential, therefore, to take an overall policy approach to GB. Our assessment is that there's no persuasive evidence to suggest that this is warranted. In addition, the other devolved administrations are content with the approach being led by the Department of Health and Social Care. This legislation is to implement international agreements which are an accepted matter and considering the extent of the full EU exit legislation programme, the Minister is minded to agree to include the Northern Ireland provisions in the UK-wide statutory instrument. Um, I have to note that um, uh, on an update from the Department of Health and Social Care, um, the legislation was laid uh, at the end of July um, and it was to go through draft affirmative process within Westminster. However, I've been informed in the past week that the legislation has been withdrawn and is due to be relayed uh, today as it happens. Um, there was an issue that has been raised around the commencement 
that it was vague in when the legislation would be commenced. Um, I'm awaiting an update from the Department of Health and Social Care on the revised draft of the legislation and the explanatory memorandum on what exactly has been changed within this piece of legislation. I would like to thank the committee for, for letting me explain uh, around what this legislation is and um, I'm, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Patricia. Patricia, the April uh, 2019 UKG Common Frameworks analysis indicated that the MRQ might be an area for common for a common framework. Is this still the case? Uh, no, uh, my understanding is that the, the common framework, um, because there wasn't a day one a nor legislative imperative, um, that the common framework for MRPQ um, wasn't wasn't deemed necessary, so it hasn't been taken forward any further. And, and does the NI protocol have any impact on this issue? Uh, no, not that, that I'm aware of. Um, there's nothing in the, in the protocol which indicates around professional recognition of professional qualifications. Okay, thank you. Um, the Chair, Colin Gildenew is indicating. Colin, do you have a question for Patricia? Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, Patricia, I know you have touched upon, uh, upon this, but could you elaborate in more detail as to what the rationale was for using an SA, a statutory implement, in this case, and what the other options would have been, and why this was felt to be the best one? Um, the options that we looked at, we had originally um, gone down the route of, of having a separate SR for the pharmacists, which we would normally do. Um, the other professions um, are regulated on a UK-wide basis and the, and the general process in the past has been that those will be regulated within a UK-wide SI on behalf of the four devolved nations. Um, the reasoning behind taking forward the SI and including the pharmacists, um, the, this SI had been due to be laid before Christmas last year. Um, through Bayes, and it had been a single piece of legislation. Uh, it was then not brought forward. Um, during the first half of the year, then, it was that it was to be split into general provisions and health care. Um, Department of Health and Social Care drafted the legislation for the pharmacists. Um, we had indicated that it, it would be preferable um, in discussions when the Assembly came back and in discussions with um, internally within TEO that we would look to take forward an SR itself. However, when we then um, participated in the um, legislative forum around uh, the work programme for legislation up to the end of transition, um, to bring uh, a single S SR, which was looking after one profession and was draft affirmative procedure, it was a significant amount of work and process for not only the department but also the assembly and the option had been available to include it in the SI and it was a it was a practical um, uh, decision to advise the minister to include uh, the, the pharmacists within the UK SI. Okay, thank you. And I suppose, and, and, and in many ways, I agree with what Alex said earlier in relation to the huge amount of uncertainty that's being created here and uh, as a result of Brexit. And I have to say, when Kathy was outlining in her earlier section, the amount of legislative work that is now going to have to be undertaken in a short period of time, given that we are trying to deal with a very dangerous uh, pandemic at the same time, I think speaks to what the wisdom there would have been with, with uh, delaying all of this, because uncertainty around health is something that obviously is going to create huge anxiety. There has been a lot of issues within Cathy's presentation where there are no real clear answers and Cathy is coming back to the committee. So I think I think I just want to just want to put that on the record, but also to ask you now and again, in light of the fact that the internal markets bill, since this SI process was started, 
the internal markets bill has now been initiated in Westminster. What impact is that bill likely to have on the outworkings or the implementation of this SA, or do you know? Um, on this SA, it, the internal markets bill, as far as I'm aware, should not have any impact on this, as it's an international agreement with the Swiss and with the EFTA nations. Um, and there's no movement of, of goods within this. Um, the recognition of professional qualifications with the U in the UK should still continue. However, as Cathy has indicated, we are asking for legal advice on the work areas that we're looking at, including the impact on professional qualification recognition. Um, and we're awaiting that advice to ensure that there aren't any issues that impact that we're not aware of currently. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And just I suppose finally on that, um, while there is significant amounts of work involved in this, whichever route people go down, I think the complexity of the of the cross border issues that we're dealing with here would indicate that it would have been, I think, a, a more preferable route to have put it through the stats regs and the assembly process to allow proper scrutiny, because some of these decisions, or indeed many of these decisions, could have long term serious and wide ranging impacts. Do you have a comment on that? On that, Paula, do you, you know, what's your view, considering your responsibility in the department, what's your view of that? Um, well, in terms of this SI, this SI is, is, um, is to legislate for international uh, agreements between the UK and the Swiss and the EFTA nations. Um, there will be implications, obviously, for cross-border um, in terms of the future agreement with the EU. Um, and that that regulation will potentially be later on in this in the sort of transition period, whether or not the UK comes to an agreement. But uh, with this one in particular, it's it's looking at separate international agreements. Okay, thank you, thank you. I suppose there is a theme here of where Westminster at times clearly have not understood the complexity and therefore are poorly placed to devise legislation that will protect the interests of all our people. Well, thank you, Anna and thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Colin, thank you. Um, any other members indicating on this particular issue? Um, just before we let you um, go, Patricia, could I just ask um, how many staff in, it, in NI are currently depending on this legislation going through? Um, again, because we don't have anyone that is that is already working um, and who has their qualification recognised um, falls under the citizens' rights provision. So this is a future relationship. So it would be for future um, employ um, employees that would have qualifications from um, Iceland, Liechtenstein, or Norway or Switzerland. So there's no there's there's nobody currently that this would impact on. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you very much. Because, because they fall under the, the withdrawal agreement citizens' rights. Okay, thank you. Trisha, can I thank you very much? There's no other um, indications for questions for you, so I uh, just want to thank you for your time here at committee t uh, today and let you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, members, uh, at this stage then, have you any issues to raise um, regarding the statutory instrument? Uh, and if not, are members content to note to this point? Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to take a short. Uh, Pam, Pam. Pam. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering, is there an option to note pending feedback from Cathy? We, we, there's considerable amounts of feedback there have been uh, committed to by Cathy and the department, um, as to why these weren't taken forward as SRs rather than SAs, and we've tried to tease some of that out. But is it possible to note pending feedback, or indeed, is it possible to defer? Pending feedback. What's the time frame involved in these in the in this SA? I'll refer to the clerk. So, just in procedural terms, this is a piece of legislation going through Westminster, brought here for the committee to note. The committee has no decision-making power as such. Um, it can ask questions uh, at this point, and we've been advised that this one is particular because it relates not to the broader UK EU arrangements, 
but to put in place uh, an international treaty made between the UK, Switzerland and the EFTA countries. Um, so this is somewhat separate from the, the wider conversation and there is no capacity for the committee to do anything other than note it, but it could certainly be noted pending further work. Tom? Yeah, well, would, would members be content to, to note pending that further pending that further work back from Kathy Harrison and her team? Members, so do you consent yep. with Colm's proposal? Yep. No, no objection to your proposal, I think Colm is the answer. We'll take it as a... Okay, yes. thank you. All right. Thank you. Members, we're just going to take a, a few minutes for a comfort break. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, we've just resumed the meeting and we're on to item 8, which is the UKSI, the Nutrition Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2020. Uh, I want to advise members that the UK Department of Health and Social Care is proposing to make a statutory instrument to amend the Nutrition Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2019 and to revoke the Nutrition Amendment, Northern Ireland EU Exit Regulations 2019. The Food Standards Agency has advised that the proposed 2020 regulations will introduce provisions to reflect the UK's exit from the European Union and the application of the withdrawal agreement on the NI domestic nutritional labelling, composition and standards legislation. The proposed regulations will disapply the 2019 regulations in respect of Northern Ireland, amending the extent of its application from the UK to GP reflecting the Ireland uh, or Northern Ireland Protocol. The FSA has further advised that a short, targeted, technical four-nation consultation was held from the 9th to the 30th of July and that the consultation responses were largely positive. It advised that some respondents raised concern regarding the possibility of legislative divergence between NI and the rest of the UK, the complexity of the NI Protocol, leaving it hard to estimate impact and emphasise the need for trade between NI and the rest of the UK to remain unrestricted. The FSA advises that this SI will not have an equivalent in the Republic of Ireland as NI will continue to follow EU obligations. The position in the Republic of Ireland will be the same in respect to the NLCS. Uh, an official is available from FSA. Um, should members have any issues that they wish to uh, raise in regard to the SI. So if members have any issues to raise with this statutory instrument and are members content to note? Content to note. Okay, thank you very much. Members, okay, so we're moving on then. Um, so the next two agenda items um, our further travel restriction SRs. Members, we have been advised that no official is available to take questions today. And while acknowledging that we wrote only to the department following last week's meeting requesting, once again, the statistical evidence underpinning the proposed changes, we have um, two rules for consideration at today's meeting without that additional information and without an official available to answer any questions that we may have. So I would therefore propose that we defer our consideration of both rules until next week, if members are content. Chair, sure, content with that. Um, can I add as well, can we get some uh, up-to-date information around uh, Sweden as well? I think Sweden was included in one of the countries. Okay. Is that okay? Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks. Okay, secondly, um, given that we've been advised that officials may not be available to take questions on future rules, I would further propose that we write the Department acknowledging the work 
pressures that officials are under at present, but expressing concern at the suggestion that officials may not be available to assist the committee in scrutiny of these and future rules. We have endeavoured as a group to uh, group we have endeavoured to group sets of related SRs to avoid undue pressure on officials, and we've also been content to have officials on standby to take a call. So I do think that we've been reasonable and will continue to be reasonable. But ultimately, it is for the committee to decide if we need an oral briefing or not. Uh, members agreed. Paula? No, I, I, I'm not prepared really to agree with that per se. I think that um, because of the emergency powers that come through to the minister and the executive under the Coronavirus um, Act and Health Protection Regulations, that. We, as a committee, have a role in terms of scrutiny and to find out and dig deeper in terms of some of the thinking and some of the of their work in, in bringing forward these statutory rules. So, I think it's the very least. It's not every week they're coming, but um, I think it's the very least they would be available to the committee so that we can ask those questions. I think that's our our principal role during this time. Okay, Alex. Um, that's not acceptable. What the, what they're saying. There has to be officials available to this committee, and I, I would like to say it said quite sternly that that is not an acceptable position. You know, we've played ball with, with the, the health department and officials all the time, and we've never caused them any grief or anything. So, um, this is a, a heavy committee. It's probably one of the most important. That language is just not acceptable. They have to be here when we need them. Right, that's my opinion. Great. Thank you, Alan. Just, I wonder maybe if the clerk could explain to us just what the, uh, the the various options are for us in relation to an SR coming through, because uh, you know ultimately uh, the do land on the floor of the the House of the Assembly for you know for the final scrutiny. Um, so, is there? Can we almost step back from our responsibility if we feel that we can't uh, carry out our scrutiny mm -hmm. function to the best of our ability? Can we step back and, and by, let it just bypass and go into the assembly and be dealt with uh, in there? Or do we have to actually make a, a, a yes or no on, on, the, on an SR? So I suppose this takes us back to the different types of assembly control and different types of SR that the committee gets. So these travel regulations are subject to what's known as the negative um, procedure. That means that this committee has a period of time during which it could decide to object and bring a motion to the Assembly to say that it wishes to uh, oppose um, these regulations. Once that statutory period expires, um, there is no further option um, for the committee to challenge those in, formally in the chamber. In other words, they go live. When these travel restrictions are changed, they go live right away, and it's for the committee to object if they wish. So the House doesn't have a role unless the, this committee objects to the regulation. Now, um, in respect of the wider lockdown restrictions and the easing of those restrictions, those have been brought in by the confirmatory procedure. So again, they go live, but um, they lapse or fall off the statute book if they're not confirmed by a motion in the chamber. Um, so, if this committee were not to do its to conduct its own scrutiny, there would still be a debate in the chamber in that instance. Um, uh, but members may well take the view that this is one of the principal roles of the committee is to scrutinise legislation, and that therefore it's a particularly important role. Um, options in terms of managing the work programme, or as the chair has said, to group batches of related SRs together so that we don't unduly, unnecessarily bring officials back every single week, and that's what the committee has been doing. Um, secondly, where things have been minor or technical, the committee has kindly agreed that officials may remain on standby as they did with the previous item, and the committee takes a short break if necessary to get that official on the line, minimising any disruption because they're coming in by starting, so they're at their desk and not interrupted unless necessary. So. Uh, those have been workable options that, that we could first, try to continue. Uh, scenario that the, the, the clerk has talked about, the, the negative thing. Um, we, we can't do our job unless we have the ability to, to question. I mean, it's, 
we would be completely failing in our duty just to, to rubber stamp something and say, no, we have no objections to it without being able to dig into it. I mean, it could well be the case that 95% of the time we won't have a question you ask, but you still have to have that facility available to you to do that. Absolutely. To carry out your job. Thanks, Chair. I just concur with people. I mean, I think we do need officials here. I mean, these uh, ASRs are often quite complicated. Um, and for my part, I think we need more scrutiny. Uh, you know, times I, I have asked questions and others have asked questions, we haven't got clear answers. So the idea that there may be a suggestion that there won't be or there may be a whittling down of officials, I think is unacceptable. It would make a mockery of the committee, uh, and I would be strongly um, against it. I think we need to see more scrutiny from the, the department's perspective. Yeah, well, I think it's very clear that we're all, we're all agreed that we do go back to the department on that issue, and, and I'm sure the clerk can um, reflect our concerns. Yes, Colm, sorry, I forgot about you. <laughs> Is your wee blue hand? Yeah, thank you. I just want to concur with the comments that have been made there, and also with your comments in relation to, you know, it is a number of weeks ago we, we actually asked uh, the chief scientific advisor in person to give us a flavour of what types of, of information was assessed and used to make these decisions and he committed that he would return to us. We have written to the department and I think it's it's true to say that we have facilitated the department with a huge amount of, of regulations. We have, we have put on additional meetings to cope with the workload. We've been flexible with the department in terms of, of their time of officials and we have supported the messaging and promoted the messaging and all of that. So I think it is incumbent on the map, absolutely. And I, I think we should, I agree with the decision to defer them and that we write to the department and indicate that we, in order to apply our scrutiny role, we need to be able to uh, drill into the detail of what we're being asked to uh, to to take note of or, or whatever the case may be. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate it. Okay, members, we're moving on then to Item 11, which is the correspondence. Turn to the correspondence uh, and refer you to uh, correspondence at tab 11, the pack and the table papers, and to the correspondence memo at tab 11.1. I want to draw your attention to several items. 11.2 is the correspondence memo from last week's meeting. I would advise members that the action list was agreed by email and uh, thank the, minister, or the members for their cooperation in that particular item. Uh, item 11.4 is a further response from the Minister of Health regarding the revised terms of reference for the independent review of the RQIA board resignations. Have members any comment to make on that item? And if not, are members content to join me in welcoming the acceptance of a number of committee suggestions? And are you content that we use social media to highlight the committee's work and the positive changes that have been agreed? Yeah, no, I think it's very welcome. Yeah. Sorry, Paula, and then, and then I was Colin. just going to say I very much welcome the, the swift response. Obviously, we had very legitimate concerns, and I think that the, the changes go some way to addressing those. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Colin? Yeah, similar. I do. I do welcome the changes that have been made, and uh, I think I think there are certainly other things, but it it is it is welcome that the terms of reference have been, as I would say, it improved in in relation to their ability to get to the the bottom of some of the matters involved. Okay. Thank you, Colm. Cool. Uh, okay, so we're moving on to item eleven point seven. It's a copy of correspondence from a representative of Mesh Ireland who um, are seeking a meeting with the Minister and has also asked to brief the committee. Uh, have the members any comments around this? Paula? Um, I, I think a lot of this sort of stems back to pre-COVID really um, because I think this was phased before around looking at the issue around Mesh implants and I had suggested at that time that Hernia Mesh and I would also be invited to that, so I think this is a valuable session. But if we could have maybe a couple of representative groups of that, it would give a broader picture of, of the impact. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I would just like to um, reinforce the urgency in having this session. Um, ideally, what we're hoping to do it um, before the Julia Cumberledge review reported with the recommendations. That's now happened. And I do think it's worrying that I know that Mesh Ireland um, have the minister has declined to meet with them um, on the basis that he did do a meeting with another um, local Mesh group. 
Um, he has also declined to meet with um, myself on the issue. Um, so I would be in favour of having that, and even if we do it a broader mesh session, although it, there is differences between the hernia mesh and the pelvic mesh, um, but it's a, it's a really important area of healthcare that we should be looking at, um, particularly given the recommendations um, that were in the Cumbered Age report. Okay, uh, so members, you, you'll be content then to, um, that we write to the individual informing her of the committee's correspondence with the department on the implementation of the recommendations of the independent review, and are members also content to add the matter to the forward work programme pending a decision on a virtual stakeholder meeting later in the year. Okay, thank you. Um, item 11.18 is from an individual regarding HPV screening. Have members any comments on that particular correspondence? Um, or are members content to write and seek an update from the department on the matter? Thank you. Item 11.19 is from an individual regarding the neurology recall issue. Members will remember that the committee wrote to the department requesting that officials meet with those affected who are not part of patient groups and received commitment from the department that the meeting would be arranged. However, no date has been set by the department. Uh, Orlea? Yes, thank you. Um, could I propose that, obviously, given the, the patients, the victims and families have been waiting for a long time on progress on this issue, um, could I propose that the, the committee um, invites Brett Lockhart and his co-chair of the independent neurology inquiry to the committee to give an update on their work and could I make a second proposal um, that the committee writes to the minister and the CMO asking for a date for the release of the cohort 2 report um, as I know that McBride had already promised families that this would be released mid-September. Okay, Jerry. Okay. Sure, can I come back to another item previously after this as well? Um, yeah, I want to second the proposal. There. I just think it, it is disappointing that um, the, the department hasn't met the families, uh, the person in the correspondence is a constituent of mine and, and Orlea, and the families are disappointed uh, that the department hasn't uh, met them. So I, I want to second that um, proposal as well. Okay, members content then with that form of action? Okay, thank you. Um, Joy, which? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it was just 11.13 on the request from Transgender NI to brief the committee. I think that's going to be added to the forward work pro programme. Uh, but I I've had a lot of correspondence from, from the community about lack of services. Um, there's, there's been no real uh, proper um, implementation of, of services for the community in, since 2018. So I know there's a wider issue with um, uh, uh, backlogs in, in, in healthcare, but it seems to be particularly bad for, for that community. So I just think it would be useful that we can uh, get a briefing from um, the group, Alexa or, or whoever. Just just confirm that the members content with the proposed action. That yeah, we're adding to the four work program. To, um, yeah. um, can I just further to that? I think that it would be useful if we got an update from the department in terms of the review of gender um, identity services, which I think is. Another um, concern mm. of transgender and I in terms of the lack of transparency around that process at the minute. So I suppose if we're going to do a session, it would be useful if we had the department and transgender and I there. Agree, yeah. Okay, members. Um, okay, we're on to item 11.22 from the Evangelical Alliance regarding support services for children with um, special educational needs and their families during COVID-19. And connected to this item is 11.29 in table papers, is a letter from the Minister advising of a consultation on the Vulnerable Children and Young People's plan to be launched tomorrow. Um, and I would also like to add in to um, 11.7, which was the correspondence from uh, the National Autistic Society, which is very much related to uh, the, the same issues, um, and I would I would like to propose that um, just as we did with the, the meeting with GPs, that we would maybe have a um, a virtual meeting arranged separately, just to deal with that one particular issue. If members are in agreement that that all members can can attend if if they're able to do so, mm -hmm. if you're happy enough, uh, we could agree that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Colm. Um, so, um, are members content to note the consultation and inquire? Um, we don't need to. No, we don't need to go for that. But that's okay. Uh, so, sorry, we'll move on to 11.26 at this point then. It's the 20th report for the Examiner of Statutory Rules. Members will, be, will remember that the committee considered a number of statutory rules at last week's meeting and agreed that it had no objections subject to the Examiner's report. The Examiner has now reported that the following statutory rules are in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the Department's reason for the breach. And that's for SRs 2020, 154, 155. 163, 168, 179, 185 and 189. In addition, the examiner has reported that she has no issues with SR 2020 forward slash 142, 164 and 170. Are members content to note the examiner's report? Agreed. Okay. 11.28 11. is from the Public Accounts Committee informing this committee of the Public Accounts Committee's inquiry into addiction services. Are members content to write the Public Accounts Committee asking that it keep the Health Committee informed of its progress and to forward the Hansard of the session uh, this committee held with the Northern Ireland Drug and Alcohol Alliance on the 21st of May? Great, thank you. Olé. Agreed. Yes, Chair, just, just on that um, item of correspondence, um, I think that, again, this is, um, well, in my view, it should be another important priority um, for us as a, a Committee for Health. Um, the issue of addictions, um, we were able to um, thankfully get that onto the Fort Work programme for PAC and um, I just think the committee should keep a close eye to it and we should definitely pick it up once the Public Accounts Committee have completed our inquiry. Um, I think it's going to be a really, really important one um, that, that we should be working on from a health perspective. Um, and maybe just to touch on, because there was different items of correspondence in this week's PEC, um, more generally around mental health, you had the Bernardo's mental health, their recommendations um, around children and young people. You have the infant mental health was 11.9. Um, the transgender stuff that Jerry spoke about, there's a mental health um, a aspect to all of that. Um, and then there was also 11.24 was um, the issue around the um, gambling and reducing harm. So I know that um, I had emailed the, the clerk just informally last week around the Fort Work programme and not to add on mental health as a side issue. Um, but I do think that we do, and I know we're busy with our Fort Work programme and with the inquiry and stuff, um, but if we can make time and space um, to do a focus session um, on the area of, of mental health because you know that's a lot of correspondence even just within this week's pack on a lot of big issues you know when, when you look at each one of them individually so if members are content that we would try and get it in somewhere I know we're, we're busy with other things as well though. Okay any other comments from members? Uh, uh, just um, to follow up on that I was going to come in as well around that um, briefing note on the gambling APG starting in two minutes the next meeting but um, in that um, response or in that um, briefing note they talk about welcoming the meeting between the Minister for Communities and the Minister for Health in relation to a joint approach to addressing problem gambling. Um, I'm just wondering is there any way we could actually ask for a readout of where they are with that? Has there any been any progress just write the Department of Health and see because as we know before there, there are actually no specific services at the minute so it's really to see what progress has been made. Okay. That. That's great. And uh, apart from those issues that have been mentioned, then are members otherwise content with the actions outlined in the correspondence this tab at 11.1? Agreed. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Um, so, uh, in terms of the table papers, there's one other item of additional correspondence in that pack, item 11.30, it's from the Minister regarding Tempe temporary changes to the health and social care framework document designed to underpin his approach to rebuilding services. Are the members, any comments on that piece of correspondence? Are, are members content to note uh, the launch of the 12-week consultation and to seek a further session with the Minister on rebuilding services? Okay, thank you. Uh, on to the forward work programme, item 12. 
May I refer members to the draft forward work programme at 12.1 of your pack, and our members can tend to note the forward work programme subject to the amendments to reflect the inquiry timeline. Agreed. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Colm. And on to 13. Any other business? Any members with any other business? Colm? No? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sorry, Sorry uh, Alex. Didn't see you there. Um, I'm still getting complaints about um, antenatal appointments and scans and partners not being able to go with uh, am I wrong? I thought that had all been resolved, but it's Pres obviously not. Presumably that's in relation to the, the new restrictions on I think, which probably wrote and I think then that the, the the trust had uh, published um, actions were in you know, certain rate of transmission or whatever with the virus, so I think it can step forward and step back, and I think that's probably the issue, but we could probably write and ask for clarity. Yeah. You'd, you'd probably be having a briefing next week, I would imagine, on the new regulations, so if you wish you could, you could address that. it there at that meeting, might be the fastest way to get to it. Okay. Chair, I, I've actually emailed Cathy Jack at Belfast Trust this morning about this issue, but I'm not sure whether all the hospitals are also in, in, in your constituency, but it is, as you say, it's something that keeps coming up, but I'm happy to forward the response. Please. You said some changes in 11th of September, but I didn't think there was widespread as, as what we're hearing from constituents. I, mean, I think uh, in terms of the, the local restrictions, certainly there, there's, with that comes that limit on visitation. Uh, to care homes and hospitals, I think, of, of one person once a week, I think, I think is right. Yeah. So, um, uh, something certainly we can, we can raise next week at okay. the committee. Thank you. Okay. That's great, thank you. Okay, members, um, we're on to a date and time and place of next meeting. The next meeting will be held Thursday 24th of September at 10am in room 29. Thank you. Next is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Science.